Good afternoon, guys. Can you hear me back there? Okay. Yeah. How is your day going so far? Awesome, awesome. So everybody's been talking about you know containers and microservices and platform two applications and platform three applications. I'm going to talk about storage because at the end of the day, everything is on storage, right? And it's often in the context of private cloud, it's an afterthought, but it can be a real, real bottleneck if it's not really thought thoroughly. So I'm going to talk about. Uh, EMC Extreme IO scale out our flash storage, really designed for this virtual era, uh, really optimized to make be uh, take benefits of everything flash has to offer. Right, so what's happened in the data center? If you think about last five to 10 years, data centers have undergone dramatic transition. Storage, however, hasn't fundamentally changed. So what's happened in a data center? You know, the environments have gotten extremely dense. There are hundreds, if not thousands of VMs usually in an enterprise data center. So what happens when there's a, v, uh, there's a whole bunch of VMs sitting on top of hypervisor trying to access the storage layer, right? So hypervisor essentially randomizes all those requests, breaks it, chops it up, randomizes them. It's called IO blender effect. So storage was not designed for this kind of really high random IO, small black uh, random IO kind of use. Storage can often become a bottleneck if it cannot serve these requests timely manner. Secondly, there's provisioning and cloning of VMs. It's something entirely different. It's not like provisioning uh, a new hardware machine. So this provisioning and cloning activities actually, you know, they've, they've become a lot more automated. So it's not only the VM admins who do that in, uh, anymore. If you're, pri if you're uh, having a private cloud, your end users are cloning the VMs, provisioning the VMs. You have no control as a VM admin on when that's gonna happen. So these cloning activities are extremely high in terms of their IO uh, uh, load on the storage. Uh, these activities start kicking in. Why is it going forward? These activities start kicking in at the wrong time of the day. If you have your Oracle database running your mission critical application, somebody says clone me to 20, 20 VMs. Your Oracle is gonna uh, come to a crawling halt. That's another reality. Next, you often have policy-based automation. You know, you, you balance your load, uh, balance your VM, balance your environment in a very dynamic manner. Uh, so, the, that also, you know, you, you don't know when that's going to happen. Again, really, really, really stressful for storage. Uh, so traditional storage architecture was really not designed for this. If you think about storage, fundamentally hasn't changed in the last few years. Right, so storage really ha hasn't changed fundamentally. It's the dual control architecture that have been prevalent for the last 15, 20 years. Maybe there are evolutionary incremental changes to how storage is optimized, but really fundamentally it hasn't changed for these new realities, you know, for these uh, random small block, 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 massive random IO requests, for, you know, cloning, you know, multi-gigabyte VMs on the fly, for balancing, you know, v-motioning your VMs and moving them on the storage tier as well as compute tier. Storage really hasn't changed. It can often become a bottleneck in this new environment. So what do you need, actually, to make sure your private cloud, uh, OpenStack private cloud, runs optimally, runs predictively on a storage, right? So. If you think about uh, what are the storage requirements, the first and the most basic one is acceleration. Essentially, that means you want to be able to deploy your private cloud in a quick manner. Time to value has become extremely important. It has become a competitive uh, factor for many organizations in order to be able to be comp uh, competitive in this environment. So you, you want to be able to deploy new services, your private cloud, quickly. It also needs to be able to provide that kind of performance that your new applications who end up using a whole lot of data need Right, so acceleration, not only from deployment standpoint, but also from application performance standpoint. The storage platform needs to be able to consolidate multiple different kinds of workloads very effectively. You know, in a private cloud, by nature, is a mixed workload environment. You have no control over what kind of environment it's going to be host hosting. You know, sometimes it may be you know uh, OLTP kind of environment. It may, it may have VDI on it. It may have you know any other kinds of uh, workloads, and you have no control. So you need a storage platform that can handle this diverse workload characteristics efficiently. You want to have a storage environment that not only can, can provide that performance for those diverse uh, needs, but it also can consolidate that efficiently. So you have you know, hundreds and hundreds of VMs. They're, they're duplicate inherently. So how do you uh, architect a storage that can make use of these duplicate duplications and reduce the storage sprawl? So that's also critical consolidation consideration. And then lastly, storage, although it's at the bottom of the tier, it needs to be able to integrate with everything that's about it. Compute, management, application, orchestration, all of those layers. So that's what you need in a storage platform. And Extreme I, I'm gonna de demonstrate how Extreme IO kind of fits into this. 
how Extreme IO can help you achieve all of these things uh, really optimally, really uh, efficiently, and a really sim in a really simple manner. So I'm just going to uh, run you through a few slides that explain how Extreme IO was architected, what's the philosophy behind it, and how it's really designed for today's reality. So Flash has been, has, has been on the market probably for a few years. When the Flash first came to market, everybody's first instinct was, now we can get a whole lot of IOPS. Now we can lower the latency. We can go a lot faster with Flash. Of course, those are stable stakes. Flash will get you to go faster. But what else can you do with Flash? If you can really uh, design uh, your storage, architect your storage with the new realities, with Flash in mind, you can actually get a lot smarter. And that was the philosophy behind Extreme IO. So not only get fast, but also get smarter. And maybe put it put together, it will enable some unique business uh, value. With that in mind, Extreme IO was designed. And so it's kind of evident. Extreme IO has been on the market probably a little over two years. It was pretty much the last all flash storage to come to the market. You know, many other competing products were already there. Despite that, Extreme IO is now number one uh, all flash storage today with 34% market share in 2014. 2015, we are estimating somewhere close to 40% market share. That's number one, num number two, number three, put together greater than that. Whole lot of data hosted on Extreme IO. Uh, you know, 60% of Fortune 100 customers use Extreme IO. So although, I mean, we took time to design this storage right. We were last to the market, but our approach worked. So what is Extreme IO? At the, at the heart of it, I, I, I kind of think of these four uh, quadrants as four defining pillars for Extreme IO. The first one is the scale out architecture. That's absolutely essential in, in, in today's world. Extreme IO scales like in a, in a building block kind of manner, brick by brick by brick. And as you add the bricks, you're adding capacity as well as performance in the form of controller resources. So it's, it scales evenly. Uh, it, it performs predictably because of this scale-out architecture. With this scale-out architecture, we can offer all of these data services. And I'm going to go into more details uh, on, on how these data services work. But all of these data services, they help reduce your storage footprint. They help protect the data that is optimized for a flash encryption and the writable snapshots, which are extreme IO virtual copies. All of that is done in line all the time and has absolutely no performance implications. There's no performance degradation when you use this. I mean, there is no way to turn these services off. And there is no performance penalty for using these services. You know, you take those snapshots and you know, how, you, how you manage the life cycle of those copies, how you integrate with applications, and that becomes integrated copy data management. It's something new that Extreme IO has uh, uh, pioneered. Copy data management as a bolt-on solution has been in the market. But there are benefits of integrating that with the storage. And Extreme IO did just that with this new architecture. And I'm going to show you how it really changes the way uh, you manage copies, whether it's copies of VMs, copies of databases, copies of volumes. And then lastly, uh, Extreme IO has this strong ecosystem of data center services that EMC offers, whether it's for data protection, continuous availability, things like that. And it also has strong ecosystem of applications that it really works well with. So let's, uh, what is an XBRIC? So XBRIC is a building block. I'm going to show you what's inside of an XBRIC. So you scale in the form of XBRIC. You start with an XBRIC. You can add another XBRIC to that. You have two XBRICs. You can, you can add two more XBRICs, four XBRICs, and you can scale up to eight XBRICs in a cluster. So inside an uh, uh, XBRIC, there are two active active controllers. Each controller has humongous RAM. It has uh, you know, uh, plenty of uh, uh, CPU cores. It has uh, you know, two uh, fiber channel and two iSCSI uh, uh, ports uh, for backend connectivity. And each XBRIC has 25 MLC drives. Now, XBRICs are available in 10 terabyte, 20 terabyte, and 40 terabyte versions. These are raw physical capacity uh, without uh, factoring in any data reduction. So no matter what size it is, it uses 25 drives. So that enables us to provide you consistent performance no matter what the size of the brick is. So how many of you know what is scale up and what is scale out? All right. So scale up architectures have been around for quite some time. Essentially, it works like this. You have two controllers. One is active, one is passive and you have a bunch of drives. You need more capacity, you add more disk trays or disk enclosures, right? So that your controller resources don't change. 
in the scale, scale, scale up architecture, you're actually wasting half of the resources just standing by being in a passive mode just in case the active one fails. So you're not really utilizing your controller resources very well. Moreover, as your capacity grows, as the scale grows, the ratio of the performance that controllers can provide and the capacity that those controllers have to support deteriorates over time. So that essentially runs into bottleneck. And this architecture was kind of okay when the media was spinning media. Because spinning media often used to be the bottleneck, controllers rarely became a bottleneck, so it was kind of okay. In certain situations, it would not work, but in most situations, it did work. As soon as you change that to flash, the bottleneck is moved up to the controllers. And what's the point in having fast media if you're gonna choke it at the controller level? So that's the problem with the scale-up architecture in today's all-flash world, uh, where scale-out is absolutely necessary. So look at this, so this is extreme IO scale-out. You can put eight X bricks in a cluster, you can have 16 active controllers working together all the time. They're closely coupled, tied together with an RDMA fabric in the back end. They work like one cohesive cluster. You have 16 uh, controllers in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a cluster. Even if one fails, you're not gonna lose a whole lot of performance. And these are all active all the time. And this active, active in, uh, kind of uh, architecture is really hard to get right. And that's why Extreme IO was last to the market, but with a good architecture. So with Extreme IO, you can scale capacity and performance together. Now, what, no, the numbers that you see there, they are realistic numbers. They're not hero numbers. They are while keeping latency below a millisecond uh, with, with eight, 8 KB block size. What can you achieve? You can achieve up to 2 million read IOPS. You can achieve up to 1.2 million read-write IOPS, mixed IOPS. And they scale really linearly. You know, two, two X bricks will provide you twice the IOPS than one X-brick would, exactly twice, while comp the compromising no latency. Latency stays below a millisecond. Another thing with the scale-up architecture has been the controllers, right? It's a dual controller architecture. You cannot keep all the metadata in these two, just two controllers. So the metadata one, it cannot be very granular. It becomes very chunky. Secondly, the metadata has to be destaged to risks. The metadata is really key if you want to do any, any, anything smart with what's inside the storage. And if you're gonna destage that metadata to disk, every time you need it, you need to move it back from the disk into the controller, play around with it, and put it back on the disk. You know, messes up with your performance. Also, you cannot do uh, many of the things like, you know, the deduplication in line because you don't know if the data is duplicate or not just in the controller because you have to access the disk to figure that out. Not good. That's one of the reasons extreme IO scale-out architecture works really well because we keep all of the metadata in these controllers. In this example, you have four X bricks, eight controllers. Every X brick has 25 drives, so you have 100 drives supported by eight, eight controllers. Everything is in the memory. You wanna take a snapshot, it's done right in the metadata. You, a, a stream of data is uh, coming, coming down to the storage cluster. You can figure out if there's a duplicate data in that right in the controller. You don't have to touch the, disk, disk, uh, the, the data plane at all. And all of these controllers are tied together with a 40 GBPS RDMA fabric that facilitates this inter-controller inter communication without any performance degradation. Now, we, you put it all together, that's really what you need if you want to have a consistent, predictable platform that delivers high performance day after day under any load conditions, right? Flash by itself is not enough. Scale-out scale is, uh, is important, but it's not sufficient. On top of that, we lay out this uh, fingerprint-based uniform data placement. What that does is, no matter how small a stream of data you write, it gets broken and spread over all available drives. Any volume you put goes on all available drives. In the last example, there were 100 drives. You create a volume, that's going to go on those 100 drives. You write one megabyte uh, byte of data, that's going to get cut up on all the drives. So you're actually getting performance, read and write, from all of those drives no matter what the data stream looks like. And all of these data services, because we have metadata in the memory, because we have you know, abundant controller resources, CPU cores as well as RAM, we can deliver these data services in line all the time. There is absolutely no way you can turn it off, and you don't want to turn it off because there is no performance penalty. Thin provisioning. So any volume you create is thinly provisioned by default. No space is consumed until data is written. Inline deduplication, it's global. No, it's not only uh, within that volume, it's not only within that brick, it's in that cluster. If the, if the stream of data exists anywhere in any of the volumes in that cluster, 
it will not be written. It will just be a metadata operation. Uh, no disk IOs will be spent. Compression, things that, that don't dedupe do really well. Databases, Compre they compress really well. So we see some somewhere like 2.3 to 3 is to 1 kind of compression ratios on databases. Extreme IO data protection, so it replaces RAID. Uh, it really simplifies. You don't have to figure out what RAID you want. Extreme IO data protection, optimized for a uh, flash, you can lose up to two drives in one XBrick. So in a cluster, you can lose up to 16 drives uh, at a time simultaneously, and you'll still keep going. Uh, it has extremely low overhead. About 18% of the capacity is spent for the data, data protection, and it uh, gives you performance better than RAID 5. Encryption is done right on the drives, so no performance penalty, no bolt-on solution, no added cost. Uh, encryption is right on the drives. And then once you have data, whether it's VM or a database or a LUN, you can take extreme IO virtual copies. Again, copies by definition are duplicate. We have everything in the metadata. So it's a metadata control plane operation. There is no data plane operation when you're taking a snapshot. So you're not spending any capacity, wasting any capacity. You're not creating any disk IOs when you're making snapshots. So what's the practical implications of that, right? What can you do with it? So before that, so ICDM, or integrated copy data management. So you put it all together. You have a hardware platform that is designed to deliver these functionalities uh, without performance degradation. You have smarts within the storage array to create these extreme IO virtual copies. You have application integrations with Oracle, with SAP LBM, uh, with uh, Microsoft. And then you uh, allow end users, your DBAs, your application owners, to use the storage functionality, the extreme IO virtual copies, from their application interfaces, and you have integrated copy data management. You don't need a bolt-on solution uh, for, you know, whether it's for data protection or for DevOps. You can do it right from extreme IO. So what are the implications, right? Uh, extreme IO virtual copies and this all, uh, the way we do in-memory metadata copies, why, why are they so important in today's world? So this is how conventionally a VM is cloned. Hypervisor says, I want to make a copy of a VM, which is how usually VMs are provisioned. You have templates, and, and, and you say, yeah, this template made me 20 copies or five copies or whatever. When that happens, the, the, the data, data is actually read and written to the disk on the data plane in, in traditional situations. So five copies will take five times as much space. It will create a whole lot of IOs. If it's 20 gig VM, 20 gig into uh, 500 gigs of data being read and written, lots and lots of disk IOs are wasted. It's a brute force copy. Right? It's capacity sprawl, uh, disk IOs and performance a hog, and it takes a whole lot of time. With Extreme IO, you change all of that, right? You have VM, say your template VM, that's optimized. It's a Linux VM, has Oracle in it, really optimized, fine-tuned, and you want to make a copy because you want to give it to your DevOps team. You say, copy that VM. It's done right in the metadata. See, the, the, the top tier here is the metadata in the controllers. The bottom tier here is the disks in the data plane. Nothing actually happens in a data plane. Uh, it's only metadata operation. New pointers are created pointing to the same data. The implications are the copies are immediate. The copies are free. You're not wasting any space. Unless you start changing data, there is no capacity penalty. And there's absolutely no performance penalty because you're not wasting any IOs in reading and writing the data. Uh, reading and writing is a dumb operation. If, if your controllers are smart enough, why would you waste those valuable IOs, which are better uh, preserved for the workloads that demand those, not for dumb copy operations? Another example, right? Take any example, at any database or application environment. Say you have a 10 terabyte database. Usually that translates to more than 70 terabyte. If it's something like uh, SAP, about 150 terabytes by the time you're done making copies for test, dev, QA, staging, whatever it is. And this doesn't even uh, uh, include the copies for your, uh, you know, multiple copies for your DevOps teams. So 10 terabyte means you, you want to make six copies of that. It's extremely slow. It's brute force copy. Lots of IOs uh, on the disk, lots of data uh, on the network, and they're extremely rigid. If you want to refresh those copies, it doesn't work. It, it's, it's a brute force copy all over again. You take that on with extreme IOs virtual copies. You have 10 terabyte database. Let's conservatively assume that you can compress it to 2 is to 1. It becomes 5 terabyte. 
You want to give six copies or 60 copies. It doesn't matter. They're free and they're immediate. And a, a month from now, your developer says, hey, I want to look at the fresh data. It's not a brute force copy again. It's just assigning new pointers, pointing to the new data. That's it. So very efficient. Instant refreshes, instant copies, and near zero cost. And near because as soon as you start changing that data, there is going to be incremental cost. But how much of that change is going to be? Realistically, you know, in, in, in database environments, we see, you know, if you count copies, people you know, achieve, you know, five is to one, six is to one kind of data reduction with these copies. And then uh, the last thing I talked about was integration. So we have native integrations and tools uh, for application integrations, but we also have these REST APIs, open REST APIs, that we ourselves use in many, many different uh, uh, um, uh, the ways we integrate, so the, the plugins that we develop. Now, you, as an enterprise, has custom workflows, which most of our customers do. They can actually use these REST APIs to very effectively use extreme IO storage capabilities and integrate with their workflows. So that's essentially, that's the platform. And that, you know, this is architecturally, whether you're using it for OpenStack or, or, or any other purpose, this architecture is always going to be, you know, uh, beneficial for you. So from OpenStack standpoint, what we're doing is the REST APIs I mentioned, we have Cinder driver that uses these REST APIs. Uh, XMS is the X Extreme IO management server, and that's how they invoke native Extreme IO functionality while, uh, with, with your uh, 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 operations that happen on, uh, on OpenStack. So I just want, I'm not gonna go through each of these. I just wanna show you that you know, we have been committed to OpenStack for a while, and we've, you know, over time we've added more and more advanced functionality. Uh, for, uh, for, for our center driver. So this was in Juno. This is what we added for Kilo. This is what we added for Liberty. And this is, we're working on Mitaka. This is what we're gonna add for Mitaka. So one of the reference architectures, so we also rigorously test Extreme IO with many different OpenStack distribution. This, is, this example is Red Hat. Uh, you know, we're working on this. A paper should be out in, in a month. If you want to go to emc.com slash Extreme IO, you can look it up and, uh, in a month's time, and you should have that paper. But we've done a lot of work with VMware for VMware integrated OpenStack, and Trevor's going to help explain the work that we've done there. All right, thank you, Vikram. Sure, thanks, Trevor. So um, we are working actively with all of our storage partners, including EMC, to make sure that any kind of OpenStack experience that folks want to have on vSphere works well with their platforms. So uh, we do storage a little bit differently with vSphere. Uh, as you may or may not know, uh, we leverage the concept of data stores and all the management of the drivers and um, all of the carving up the lens is done in the background and then just present it to OpenStack in a simple way. So uh, what we wanted to do was get a reference architecture with Extreme IO, and we worked on this particular project where we were trying to see what kind of performance we could get with working with uh, the benefits that Vikram mentioned before, including extremely fast deployment, the ability to eliminate overhead from our VM copies, and you'll see in a few slides some of the performance benefits that we got. Oh, does, okay, I'll just switch to the keyboard. Okay, so before I get into the actual test results, what exactly is VMware Integrated OpenStack? Well, you take your existing vSphere environment, and then you combine it with open source OpenStack. We're not making any change to the OpenStack code. We're DEF Core compliant 100%. And then we configure VMware drivers to support uh, vCenter, VMware, uh, NSX uh, API calls. Optionally, if you'd like to get some visibility into what your environment is doing, then you can uh, get vRealize operations where we have free plugins to report on what's going on in the environment, as well as vRealize log insight for your syslog aggregation. And then the cap to all that is that it's a fully validated architecture. So we're testing it, making sure that our code is actually working properly together and uh, with all of our partners like EMC. And on top of that, there's optional support. So if you want to get a support agreement with us, we can support from OpenStack all the way down to vSphere. 
And these are the projects that are included with VIO, including uh, Nova, Neutron, and Cinder and Glance. Of course, those are basic building blocks you need, including Keystone and Swift. And they correlate to vCenter, NSX, and so forth. And I'll pause for people to take pictures of this beautiful slide. I worked long and hard on it, so please take as many pictures as you'd like. All right, all the cameras are down. I'll move next. Okay, so let's get back to the actual test results. And you can actually see our reference architecture at that link that uh, Vikram put at the bottom of the slide. So it's a good one to take a picture of, and you can check out the paper later. But here are, oh, let me go back, sorry. I was too fast for the cameras. Okay, cameras down, all right. So moving on to the test results. Uh, for our first test, we wanted to see how long it would take to stand up the control plane on an all-flash array, and especially with the benefits that Extreme IO provides. And just the VM cloning process for our control plane took less than a minute. And that's about 13 VMs, and these are production size workloads. They're not just uh, test environments where I scale down the vCPUs or the amount of RAM or the amount of storage. So in less than a minute, I had 13 VMs for my control plane already cloned and ready to go. And then from there, it was a matter of running the Ansible playbooks. So I want to emphasize that's not only because of Flash. Yes, Flash does accelerate that, but it's not only Flash. It's also because we do it just in the controller RAM. So it's happening at the speed of RAM, no data copy happening. Yeah, I'm sorry, Vikram, I didn't mention all of the no, extreme no. IO goodness there. But uh, yeah, definitely taking advantage of all of the in-memory operations that extreme IO is able to perform. So that was the control plane. What about when I'm going to deploy instances? So I created uh, two images, one was 64 gigabytes, uh, thin provisioned, and the other one was thick provisioned. And despite one being thin versus thick, the, the, the performance was pretty good. I mean, I've seen uh, thick provision instances on other infrastructure platforms take up to an hour uh, for this size of the disk. And we were able to get it in under 10 minutes, uh, both for thin and for thick provision storage. And then I did a deployment of a fairly large number of instances. Um, 50 instances took less than two minutes, 100 instances took about three minutes. So pretty much um, linear progression as to how the performance scales with the number of deployments. And last but not least, image imports can be also a time-consuming exercise. And now the slide is complete. Feel free to take pictures. Um, so we have the 64 gigabyte thin image versus the thick image. And really, um, I was really surprised to see even that much performance. Uh, it was all fiber channel, but still, it was pretty good to see how quickly I was able to import my workloads. And Vikram had to stop me from running out the building with an X brick. And um, I challenged him to find out if whether I took one or not, but I think I did, and I was able to get away with it. But uh, just showing you the power of working with OpenStack on top of Extreme IO. All right, thank you, Vikram. Thank you, Trevor. So I guess we have one more summary slide. That's it. So you know, we talked about you know what happens in a new new world. You know, it's it's entirely a different world. Uh, the storage hasn't really changed. Uh, you know, you got to look at architecture, uh, you know, in a more innovative manner if you want to be able to meet today's realities. Uh, Extreme IO is designed for this new normal, right? So the way it scales out, uh, it's all flash. Is, is you know, flash is becoming the new normal. Uh, the, you know, we're expecting the the price of flash is going to be at parity with disk uh, anytime this year. Uh, In-memory metadata makes a whole lot of difference and enables these zero penalty data services and copy services, which are tremendously applicable in today's world compared to 10 years ago. And then XTMI offers exceptional simplicity, consistency, performance. There's absolutely no tuning. You know, think about you don't have to worry about your RAID. Think about you don't, there are no tiers to think, uh, worry about. You know, you're not tying your volume to a certain drive, so you don't have to count your spindles. How easy the life would be if you don't have to. You put the box in there and there's nothing you want to do with it. That's it. Um, and con comprehensive open set, open, uh, OpenStack support and uh, um, commitment. We've been working with OpenStack since Juno, uh, consistently, consistently adding more and more functionality. And then lastly, VIO provides good enterprise car, uh, class uh, support and, and reliability around vSphere. Uh, put together, that combination can be what enterprise may find really appealing. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, 
Um, IOPS D2 won't have any. Yeah, so uh, 1.2 million IOPS is it was it uh, with deduplication. So deduplication has no implications on IOPS. So you say, for example, you're running a slab uh, at 8K uh, size, block size, mixed, you know, 50-50 read-write. That's what you would get uh, in a 16-controller, 16, 16 uh, 8X brick uh, cluster. And the point is that, you know, 1X brick would give you an eighth of that. So you can scale your performance predictably. You know, 2 will give you twice the 1 which is really rare to see uh, in a storage environment traditionally. Any other? Hi. Um, you talked about zero cost snapshots, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. uh, in your presentation? Yeah. So obviously there is nothing at zero cost, right? So it's, it's really you are delaying the cost for later. Uh, so uh, yes. So um, if I may ask, mm -hmm. it's, it's like, uh, once those, that VM starts changing, and some of those VMs would, would be changing yes. very fast, mm -hmm. so what is the price that... Uh, the delta. That, the, the delta that, that you, you, know, you have to cater for. So if it's a, you know, you take a Windows VM that has Oracle, or say Linux VM that has Oracle running in it, uh, you uh, clone that, uh, out of the gate it'll have no cost, right? Because it's exactly identical. After that, what's gonna change? Your Oracle database may change. The Oracle application is not going to change. The Linux operating system is not going to change. So it really is depends on what's, what and how much rate of change you're looking at. Uh, and uh, you know, if you take the VM, uh, uninstall Oracle, and put something else on it, then it's probably going to be a whole lot more uh, change. I, I agree with that statement. What I'm asking is what's the mechanics behind it? Like, do you have some kind of a watchdog that, that monitors with respect to the time that you have taken the snapshot versus what's been changed since then and keep writing it somewhere? I mean... So the snaps will be treated uh, as, as a separate entity, and you can monitor that from uh, your Extreme I.O. Uh, uh, GUI. Uh, you will see the capacity. So it's a volume that you're snapping, right? So you'll see from the capacity standpoint how much extra that, that, that specific volume is taken. You had mentioned that your uh, your data is distributed using some kind of fingerprint, which I, I equate to as some hash, some kind of hash function. Mm -hmm. Is that done on the client side, or is that done on on once the data gets to the array and then through Yardy May Fabric, you, you it happens when the data comes into the array and then you uh, pipe it out. Yeah, then you probably, then the controllers take care of that. They'll basically assign if the data looks duplicate, it'll be same fingerprint. So then, that me does that mean that you're kind of fully symmetric on your on your front end? What do you mean by that? So I can do I/O access from any controller to any volume. Yes, any absolutely. Yeah, volume. yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter. You have four four controllers or eight controllers, uh, because the volume is going to uh, you know stripe across all of those. Yeah, yeah. And that's why we need that 40 uh, gig uh, uh, infinite band fabric. What kind of recovery time would you have if you lost a disk and need to replace it in, let's say, in a fairly active scenario? So you can lose two disks and there won't be any downtime. Uh, but, but like a rebuild time to get your... Uh, okay. Uh, rebuild time to get, once you, once you put the new drives in, yeah. I, 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 I'm unfortunately, I'm not, uh, uh, I don't have the answer for that. Okay, thanks. question on the deduplication. So you mentioned the 1.2 million IOPS remains a constant. So if I have a 5 is to 1 dedupe ratio, mm -hmm. so it's only a capacity play at that point with no penalty whatsoever on the um, latency or the IO rate? Yes. I mean, you have 5. So, uh, dedupe or compression will have no implications on IOPS and latency. Absolutely. No matter it's a 5 is to 1 or if it's a VDI environment, we'll see something like between 10 and 20 is to 1. It's only the capacity. It's yeah, it's only the capacity. And the thing is, you know, it's going to get, no matter how small it is, uh, as long as it, it's going to get broken into 8K chunks. That's, that's our block size. And it's going to get spread on all available drives. So, I mean, the, the data stream can be fairly small, but it's going to sit on all of those drives. So it doesn't matter how much you do, it's still going to sit on all of those drives. Any more questions? Thank you.